In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A man once gave a banquet and invited many. He made two rounds of invitations. First, he sent out an announcement saying that there would be a banquet and asking his guests to RSVP. This invitation may or may not have specified the date when the banquet would be. It's not really clear in the text. The guests just knew that soon they were welcome to come to, uh, uh, to the banquet, and there, will be, and there would be a place set for them. They were excited. This guy threw a great party. They were eager to go over there at some point in the vague future. This is like us awaiting heaven and the new creation. We know that it'll be good, we just don't know when it will come. Then the day came. The man sent his servant out to announce, come, for everything is now ready. But unfortunately, while many people had RSVP that they would attend, some of those people, when the day came, they replied that they were too busy. They liked the idea of, go they liked the idea of going to the banquet. They were open to going someday, but not today. No, they had more important things to do today. The first thing that we should notice when we look at this text is that when the time comes, everything is ready. God has all things ready for you. He plans ahead. For example, before God sent his people, the Israelites, down to Egypt, he first sent Joseph to prepare for the famine. Before God ever made the world, he made a plan to save you through Jesus. He's never surprised by some unforeseen complication. Though he's always ready, always prepared. This is especially true when it comes to God saving sinners like us. Neither your perennial sins nor the ones that, that surprise you surprise God or thwart his mercy. Christ has already done everything for you. Long before you ever thought to accept God, God was already thinking of you, and he accepted you. Before you ever began to fight against your problem of greed, God already prepared his feast. Before you ever started drinking, quit drinking, relapsed, and repented again, already the banquet was entirely prepared without consulting you, without your permission, and even despite you. Everything is now ready. It's not, come up here and prepare your hearts for Jesus. No, Jesus has already come down to you. It's not, give your heart to Jesus. No, it's Jesus has already given his heart for you, given his life for you, made a decision for you. Congratulations. Everything is now ready for you. The work and the preparations, well, these are all God's work. And he's already done them, not someday, but already done. The free gift of God is ready for you and sufficient for you. Your place at the table is set, your invitation extended. But not everyone will receive it. Not everyone will go to heaven or enter eternal life. In fact, some of those who were invited, even some of those who intended to go, when the day comes, they will refuse to go in. Jesus says, For I tell you, none of those men who were invited but refused shall taste my banquet. This is serious. It's possible for people who were invited to the end times feast and even planned to attend, well, it's possible for them to later say no. Now, the banquet has been prepared for them. It's ready for them. God has extended them a serious invitation. And the Lord desires for them to come to his feast. 
But some people refuse to go in, and they are condemned. Their affliction is like that of the seed that was sown among thorns. They hear the word, they receive the invitation, but the cares of this world and the, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. They're excited to go to heaven and be with God someday, but they have more important things to do today than to be at church, to spend time in God's word and pray on their own, to learn and treasure the things of God. They think that kind of devotion is for old people with too much time on their hands. One day, maybe I'll get around to it, perhaps, but not now, not today. Here I especially want to speak to you young people, 10, 12, 14, maybe even 20 years old. At this age, it seems as though the world is open before you, that there's an infinite expanse of time in front of you. And there are so many possibilities, so many things you can already do, and even more opportunities will be opening up soon. Because there's this expanse in front of you, you might be tempted to waste these early years and then get serious about things later. Once you feel like an adult and you feel that it's time to settle down, well, please don't do that. We need to resist the notion that it's somehow normal for people to, to leave the church for a while, to wander astray, separated, and maybe, maybe even antagonistic against their parents and the, and, the, and the faith of their youth, to aim their life at what's fun and maybe even a little rebellious, to get to know the world too intimately, and then assume that, that, they'll, that one day they'll, they'll come back around, they'll settle down and get married and have kids, and then they'll come back into the church. After all, this is just what young people do, right? This is normal, isn't it? Now, this happens all the time, in fact. You know, we're in campus ministry, we see this. In fact, this was part of my own story as well, and maybe part of yours too. People say, it's normal, it's fine, it's expected. They'll probably come back, because that's just what young people do. But this is like, if your son were to join the military, that, 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 the, that then you would assume that one day he'll probably get shot, but it's fine. You would just come to expect that. Oh, that's, what, that's just what happens to soldiers. It's normal. It happens all the time. We hear it on the news every day. Don't worry about it. If he gets shot, that's fine. He'll probably get better one day. Probably. But no. This is not safe. It's not good. Young people, be wise with your youth. Don't be foolish. Don't squander your gifts on reckless living, pointless living. Set your minds, your young, vigorous, instructable minds on the most important things in the world, not on fads that'll go away by the end of summer. Why waste your life on these things? Do not think that you'll have plenty of time later for heaven and hell and spiritual stuff. Don't assume that you'll grow old. Now, we hope you do, but in no way can we guarantee that for you. Tragedy happens even to people your age who think that you're invincible. If you think, oh, I'm young, I'm sure I'll start caring about this stuff when I'm an adult when I feel like an adult, whenever, whenever that time comes, which, by the way, college students never can answer if they're a man or a woman yet. It always feels like it's some time in the vague future. Don't expect that this will just click for you and you'll just come back. No, God is, and also God has numbered each one of your days, but he won't tell you what that number is. Don't be caught off guard. Don't be like those guests who were invited, but when the day came, they simply didn't care to receive eternal life. And so the Lord sent them to hell. The feast is ready for you. It's yours. 
Your place at the table is set. Don't get distracted with, with what's trivial or amusing and lose sight of the big picture. Don't waste your mind, your body, or your life. If you do, what can happen eventually, and this is my fear for all of our inactive members as well, what can happen is that after years of pursuing the, this world's fleeting pleasures and fleeing from God's gifts, eventually your mind can become unfit for the things of God. You can lose your taste for the spiritual goodness of God. Then we train our taste buds to rightly interpret the things that we put into our mouths. We want our senses to delight in what's good for us and to reject both bitter poison, that's obviously bad, but also to reject the empty carbs that only increase our circumference. But it's easy to train your, 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 your taste buds to love sweets. It's like it's easy to follow the passions of your flesh. But if you eat only candy and drink only Coke for, for a couple of months, not only will you get diabetes, but you'll also lose your palate for vegetables and other food that's actually good for you. You'll spit them out because they're not super sweet like the stuff you become addicted to. The same thing can happen to your soul. If you spend hours every day absorbed in the latest TikTok trends, it gets hard to sit down and just read a chapter of the Bible. If you fill your eyes with objects of lust, you forget the beauty of a godly wife. If you stay away from church for a couple months, let alone a couple of decades, it's hard to come back. You lose your taste for God's gifts, for the wisdom of the scriptures, and for the feasts that set before us on the Lord's altar. Instead, you get bored and distracted like a kid who's hopped up on candy. Moreover, young people, one more thing for y'all. Try not to despise your parents when they make you do stuff you don't want to do and say that it's good for you. It's actually our job. <laughs> to make you do what is good so that you learn to love what is good. By default, kids don't like steak. That's a weird thing to me. And yet, we have our kids eat it when we cook it because it's objectively good. Likewise, we make them take medicine when they're sick because even though it tastes bad, it actually makes them get better more quickly. We bring them to church every Sunday because even on those rare occasions when we don't want to be here ourselves, still we know that this is where God gives us the goods. Young people, don't waste your mind, your body, or your life, your delight on the passions of your flesh or on the things that are simply empty. Fill your senses and your soul with what is good and true, and beautiful. Be prepared to receive the heavenly banquet whenever the Lord sees fit to call you home. The day is appointed. The table is set. There's a place for you. Congratulations. Now we need to turn and address another problem, namely when some of us take pride in always being busy. When the Lord announces, come, for everything is now ready, some of those who were invited to the banquet start to make excuses. They're too busy. They would love to come to the banquet someday, but not, not today. They have other things to attend you to today, more things that, are, things that are more important right now than the things of God. What's interesting is that each of their excuses is related to their good vocations. Two of these men say that they're too busy farming. One's bought a field, the other's bought some oxen, and so they can't come. And the other guy says that he just married a wife and he wants to spend some time with her. Well, these are good things. These are good vocations from God. 
God lets them be a farmer and a husband so that they can, so that they have people to work for and a family to love and serve. But these men make the mistake of treating these good vocations as more important than the holy things of God. They set their priorities in the wrong order. They let their good vocations distract them or entangle them to such a degree that when the end times banquet comes, they reject eternal life. And Jesus condemns them, saying, none of these men shall taste my banquet. It's extremely dangerous to put things before God. It, it's idolatry. And people who are overly busy need to hear this. It's not a law of God that you come to church every Sunday, no excuses. The Lord does not commands a particular form or frequency of your home devotion either. And even if God did command these things, Jesus died for all your sins, and he wouldn't hold these things against you. However, if you choose to enroll your kids in sports, and therefore you consistently skip church when there's a game or a tournament, that's dangerous. It's unwise. Don't do that, please. You're setting your expectations and your priorities in the wrong order, like the three men in our parable. In a few years, if your kid decides that he's going to stop playing baseball, he won't, you won't care one bit. But if he decides that he's going to stop going to church, you will be distraught, especially if you feel the guilt that you allowed this in bits and pieces along the way, and thereby you showed him that it's okay to skip church whenever you want. Don't do that to them or to yourself either. You don't need that. Set your priorities in order. Think beyond the current moment. Be concerned about more than whether your kids like you and whether they currently appreciate what you're doing for them. Use your God-given authority. Bring them to the feast, whether at Mount Calvary or wherever you find yourself that Sunday. Show them that it's important and that it's good for them. Teach them to love God's holy gifts. Raise up a child in the way he should go. The same thing is true if you consistently work every Sunday morning as well, or if you let your kids do that. With most jobs, you can and should try to get out of those Sunday shifts. Now, there are a few exceptions, especially caregivers, where someone has to be there 24-7. But even then, it should always seem like a burden, not a joy, to have to miss church. And hopefully, at least you can, you can watch online, though even then, you don't get the Lord's Supper. It's not, you know, the full goodness that God wants to give you. In the, in the parable, after the three busy men refuse to go in, what sort of people does the Lord invite to his banquet? Well, it's those who are poor and crippled and blind and lame. It's those who cannot work. Those who can only sit and drink the wine and eat the feast and say, thank you, Lord. They cannot get anything ready for the feast. They can't prepare it. They can't pay the Lord back after the fact. No, they just re graciously receive what the Lord has prepared for them. And they rejoice in the kingdom of God. Dear friends in Christ, that's who we are. Poor, blind, lame, suffering. Standing before God, knowing our guilt and shame, knowing that we have nothing to offer him. And the Lord says, Think nothing of it. Everything is now ready. Just come to the banquet. Leave your burdens. Take your seat and receive. Amen. The peace of God, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand for prayer.